the Gerontological Society of America Momentum Discussions. Welcome to the Momentum Discussion podcast series, where researchers, educators, and practitioners stimulate dialogue on trends with great momentum to advance gerontology. Welcome to the podcast of the Gerontological Society of America. I'm your host, Judith Illish, Director of Strategic Alliances at the Society. And this is one of three podcasts that we're hosting with healthcare leaders on the topic of dementia-related psychosis. Dementia-related psychosis, or DRP, is a behavioral and psychological symptom of dementia. For more background on this symptom, please tune in to the rest of our podcast or visit our webpage, geron.org slash dementia-related psychosis, uh, which we'll also link to in the show notes for this episode. In today's discussion, we'll be focusing on how psychosis in individuals with dementia is defined, identified, and diagnosed. Joining me for this conversation is Dr. Gary Small, Chair of Psychiatry at Hackensack University Medical Center, and he's also Physician-in-Chief of Behavioral Healthcare Transformation Services. Dr. Small is also the Chair of GSA's Workgroup on Dementia-Related Psychosis. Welcome, Dr. Small. Thank you, Jude. I'm delighted to be joining you on this podcast. And we're delighted to have you. So before we get into today's topic, uh, could you please share a little bit more background about uh, your ex- your training and expertise in dementia care as a geriatric psychiatrist? So decades ago, I decided to go into geriatric psychiatry. And right after my fellowship, or even during the course of my fellowship, I realized the real big problem people face as they age and trying to maintain their mental health is dealing with memory loss and dementia. And so I've devoted my career to that area, working on the research front, clinical care, and training. I've been fortunate on the research front to be involved in a lot of discoveries on early detection and recognition of the problem using genetic measures and brain imaging tools, and I've also conducted clinical trials uh, to try to develop better treatment approaches. In the meantime, I've taken care of a lot of patients and families and recognized how difficult this is. Dementia is not just an issue for the patient. It affects everyone around the patient. So it's, it's a huge area that needs greater attention, and it's particularly affecting our society because but we're living longer. We're, in a sense, we're victims of our own technological success in having greater life span expectancies because age is the greatest single risk factor for developing dementia. So, how is dementia related psychosis defined, and what would you say are the signs and symptoms that individuals and their families should be aware of? So, I think we first need to define dementia, and it's often confusing to patients, families, and even doctors sometimes. So, so the, the simple definition is dementia involves a cognitive impairment that interferes with a person's independence. So a cognitive impairment could mean memory loss. It could be difficult to with language skills, visual spatial skills, uh, paying attention, any aspect of cognition. And an important point about it being dementia is that these people are having challenges doing things on their own. Now, if somebody has dementia and they have symptoms of psychosis in addition, then we call it dementia-related psychosis. So now we need to define psychosis. And that involves the presence of either hallucinations or delusions or both. Hallucinations are essentially hearing voices or seeing things that aren't there. So these are perceptions or sensations that are not real. And delusions are false fixed beliefs. You can't convince the person otherwise. So it can can be that uh, Martians are coming after you or that uh, people are stealing things from you um, or that someone is following you. And it, despite our best efforts to talk people out of it, to give them a dose of reality, those delusions do not change. How should this information affect care planning? Well, I think that that should heighten 
the caregivers and the care providers concern about the development of symptoms of psychosis. And let me also add that these symptoms tend to develop as the dementia or cognitive impairment progresses. You don't see it as often very early on. It's usually in the more moderate and advanced dementia patients. So it should be a heightened recognition and anticipating some of these challenges and how to deal with them. I mentioned the environmental factors to, to be on the lookout for anything that might be triggering symptoms of psychosis, uh, to be sure that medical conditions are treated adequately, uh, to keep tabs on the medications that the patient is taking. Certainly, these patients are on multiple medications and drug interactions and drug toxicity is a very common contributor to mental symptoms in patients who have cognitive impairment. Could you help distinguish how does psychosis look like or manifest differently in other psychiatric conditions versus dementia? Yeah, so it's interesting that people tend to think of dementia as just a cognitive illness, but it's clear that there are many behaviors and, and many other mental symptoms that occur with it. And the one we're focusing on today is psychosis. There are other kinds of psychotic disorders. Uh, for example, schizophrenia affects a few percent of the population. And, and this is really manifest more by these delusions and hallucinations without such prominent cognitive impairment early on. Although patients with schizophrenia also have cognitive deficits. They too have trouble functioning, but it's, it's a different kind of presentation. Another psychotic disorder is bipolar disorder, where people have mood swings, where there are times when they feel depressed and down. Other times they develop mania, where they uh, lose touch with reality and have delusions and hallucinations and hyperactivity. So it's important to be able to differentiate these various psychotic conditions. But it would be unusual to have schizophrenia or bipolar disorder um, secondary to or following a dementia. As the chair of GSA's work group on dementia-related psychosis, Dr. Small, you helped shape a recent report that highlights various challenges in the diagnosis and treatment of dementia-related psychosis. Could you highlight some of the main findings of this report? In the U.S., we have about five, six million people with dementia. And you know, this it's a problem just recognizing those patients with or without psychosis. In fact, about half of patients with dementia are walking around with it and they don't realize they have it. And part of the problem is that the health system is not adequately set up to deal with these patients, to diagnose them properly, to recognize them, to screen for them, and to treat them. So if, if you compound that with these symptoms of psychosis, uh, the problem gets even worse. So if you have a patient who uh, has symptoms of dementia, they're forgetful, they have trouble expressing themselves, it's going to be hard to recognize that they also are experiencing hallucinations or that they're experiencing delusions. A lot of what they say will not be taken seriously by caregivers or healthcare professionals. So it really compounds an already challenging problem. The International Psychogeriatric Association published new criteria and some updated definitions for psychosis and dementia. In December 2020, this appeared in the American Journal of Geriatric Psychiatry. And although the authors state that these criteria are intended to advance clinical research, how do you think they might eventually influence care practices? So these criteria lay out some of the details uh, in terms of what to look for in these conditions. And it's important uh, to move the field forward we have consensus. We have groups like the 
IPA or International Psychogeriatric Association working on this. Another group that's been involved in the field is the American Association for Geriatric Psychiatry. So you get people together, you get them to agree on some of the details, uh, getting into the weeds, so to speak, of, of these different criteria, what to rule out, how to approach it. You know, one thing we haven't even discussed is there are a lot of different causes of dementia. Everybody assumes it's, it's Alzheimer's disease, which of course is the most common cause of dementia, but you can have a dementia, even a dementia-related psychosis that is uh, worsened by or triggered by a thyroid deficiency uh, or some medication side effect. And so a systematic approach to understand, to first to pinpoint the symptoms, to describe them, to codify them, as the IPA has done, and then to have a strategy of how to treat it. Part of the treatment involves trying to understand the underlying causes. Turning again to this, the perspective of the geriatric psychiatrist and the diagnostic process, how do you see the geriatric psychiatrist's role in more team-based approaches to care, which are really, I think, taking hold in both dementia care and mental health care more broadly? Well, geriatric psychiatrists uh, have the expertise. They've been trained in how to recognize and treat these kinds of conditions. They understand uh, some of the important uh, aspects of dealing with older people, the sensitivity to medications, um, the, the problems we see with cognitive impairment just in normal aging. Uh, so they they have an ideal position in terms of educating other healthcare practitioners. But a, a lot of them can be dealt with by the primary care physician to get proper training and education. And I'm curious if you've noticed in your practice or just from the work of the white paper that came out, any noteworthy examples of innovation that are designed to both bolster the role of the, of the primary care provider and ensure that there's collaboration across the disciplines in addressing dementia-related psychosis? So what we've seen in, in the last year is a, a tremendous crisis due to the pandemic. Uh, but one of the silver linings of that is it has catapulted psychiatry into the telehealth realm. And what, what we found at UCLA was that very quickly, uh, people transitioned very well. Even older adults who have, uh, are a bit more challenged by technology it seemed to like it. They didn't have to bother with uh, traffic and parking. And uh, our clinics uh, filled up very quickly. And we're doing the same thing in New Jersey. And we find that this provides greater access to care. And really, telehealth is ideal for psychiatry because uh, uh, many times we don't have to be there to perform uh, physical procedures for the patient. A lot of it is observation and, and uh, a care provider who's with the patient at the time can help out with any examination issues. So I think that that has been very helpful. And it, the other thing that can help us do, if you have someone with dementia-related psychosis, it's, it's helpful to see them in their setting, not so much in the uh, psychiatrist's office, but to look around because you know, sometimes environmental factors will contribute to these symptoms, both the cognitive symptoms and the uh, symptoms of psychosis. It may be too dark in the room. Perhaps bringing in familiar objects from home would be helpful. Maybe there's a window that uh, is exposed to the outside and that triggers some of the delusions or hallucinations. So that's, that's a helpful uh, change that we've seen. Another thing that's been going on in the last several decades is looking at new clinical care models for psychiatry. I mentioned how we just don't have enough specialists to go around, and so we need to be innovative in how we reach the patient. And so there are models where we have so-called embedded psychiatrists or integrated psychiatry, where the psychiatrist actually has, uh, they're co-located with the primary care doctors. Uh, they uh, use non-physician providers 
to help with the delivery of care and systematic um, vetted outcome measures to make sure we're hitting the sorts of outcomes that we think are important. And having what's often called warm handoffs to the primary care provider, working with them closely. You know, I saw this coming for many years. I, I worked as a consultation liaison psychiatrist and, and CL geriatric psychiatrist. A lot of the work was getting to know the internists and the geriatricians and working with them and teaching them about hand, how to handle these problems themselves. So I see that uh, as really important in moving the field forward uh, to help patients and their families. What is one last message that you'd like to leave our listeners with about dementia-related psychosis? The bottom line is to be aware of it, to understand it and anticipate it because in many patients it will occur. And the sooner you pay attention to it, the sooner you can deal with it and minimize the problems that result. And these are very stressful symptoms for both the patients and the caregivers. We know that whether or not a patient with dementia has symptoms of psychosis, it's very stressful for caregivers. Primary caregivers of patients with dementia have about a 50% risk of developing a major depression requiring medical intervention. Don't have the figures with dementia-related psychosis, but I wouldn't be surprised if the risk is even higher. And when our caregivers are stressed out and depressed and anxious, they can't help our patients and it's a vicious cycle. So keep it in mind, learn about it, understand it, and let's work together to do something about it. Thank you for that perspective, Dr. Small. This wraps up our episode on dementia-related psychosis. Thank you for listening. And please join us for our other GSA podcasts on the topic. Goodbye for now. To learn more about the Gerontological Society of America, visit geron.org. The Gerontological Society of America was founded in 1945 to promote the scientific study of aging, cultivate excellence in interdisciplinary aging research, and education to advance innovations in practice and policy. For more information about GSA, visit geron.org.